Hey guys, this is like my third time trying to record this. Basically, I'm reading this book right now called Cosmos and Psyche that I find interesting. And um, I don't know too much about it, so I don't want to even like try to describe it. But it's um, so far kind of talked about Copernicus and how um, the human discovering that the earth rotates around the sun instead of being at the center was like such a huge deal that it disrupted uh, like everyone's understanding of everything and ultimately alienates people um, and it has to do with like the rational western mind basically the world became disenchanted through like s rational scientific approach to the world which makes the subject and object have a really rigid definitive boundary where the human subject is acting upon objects. Yeah, so I've already gone on too long. I feel like I should just start reading whatever this says. Okay, this is book club. So, um, the disenchanted cosmos impoverishes the collective psyche in the most global way. Um, spoiling its spiritual and moral imagination. In such a context, everything can be appropriated. Nothing is immune. Majestic vistas of nature, great works of art, revered music, eloquent language, the beauty of the human body, distant lands and cultures, extraordinary moments of history, the arousal of deep human emotion, all become advertising tools to manipulate consumer response. For quite literally, in a disenchanted cosmos, nothing is sacred. The soul of the world has been extinguished. Ancient trees and forests can then be seen as nothing but potential lumber. Mountains, nothing but mineral deposits. Seashores and deserts are oil reserves. Lakes and rivers, engineering tools. Animals are perceived as harvestable commodities. Indigenous tribes are obstructing relics of an outmoded past. Children's minds are a marketing target. At, at the all-important cosmological level, the spiritual dimension of the empirical universe has been entirely negated, and with it, any publicly affirmable encompassing ground for moral wisdom and restraint. The short term and the bottom line rule all. Whether in politics, business, or the media, the lowest common denominator of the culture increasingly governs discourse and prescribes the values of the whole. Myopically obsessed with narrow goals and narrow identities, the powerful blind themselves to the larger suffering and crisis of the global community. In a world where the subject is experienced as living in and above and against a world of objects, other peoples and cultures are more readily perceived as simply other objects to ignore or to exploit for one's own purposes, as are other forms of life, biosystems, and the planetary whole. Moreover, the underlying anxiety and disorientation that pervade modern societies in the face of meaningless in the face of a meaningless cosmos create both a collective psychic numbness and a desperate spiritual hunger, leading to an addictive, insatiable craving for ever more material goods to fill the inner emptiness, and producing a manic techno-consumerism that cannibalizes the planet. Highly practical consequences ensue from the disenchanted modern worldview. The ambition to emancipate ourselves as autonomous subjects by objectifying the world has in a sense come full circle, returned to haunt us by turning the human self into an object as well, an ephemeral side effect of a random universe, an isolated atom in mass society, a statistic, a commodity, passive prey to the demands of the market prisoner of the self-constructed modern iron cage. <clears throat> and then here's a quote from Mac from Max Weber. Max Weber. 
Um, no one knows who will live in this cage in the future or whether at the end of the tremendous development entirely new prophets will arise and there will be a great rebirth of old idea ideas and ideals or if neither mechanized petrification embellished with a sort of convulsive self-importance. For the last stage of this cultural development, it might well truly be said, specialists without spirit sensualists without heart this nullity imagines what it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved oh wait it, this nullity nullity specialists without spirit sensualists without heart i don't know about that this nullity imagines what it has attained that it has attained a level of civilization. Yeah, like, um, we need to end civilization, basically. Okay. So, defined in the end by the by its disenchanted context, the human self too inevitably disenchanted. I ha Okay, I have to admit, up until this part, I've, I've read it already. Now I'm kind of reading it fresh. So, it's this is my first time reading it. Defined in the end by its disenchanted context, the human self, too, is inevitably disenchanted. Ultimately, it becomes, like everything else, a mere object of material forces and efficient causes, a socio-biological pawn, a selfish gene, a meme machine, a biotechnological artifact, an unwitting tool of its own tools. For the cosmology of a civilization both reflects and influences all human activity, motivation, and self-understanding that take place within its parameters. It is the container for everything else. This, therefore, has become the looming question of our time. What is the ultimate impact of cosmological disenchantment on a civilization? What does it do to the human self year after year century after century to experience existence as a conscious purposeful being in an unconscious purposeless universe what is the price of a collective belief in absolute cosmic indifference what are the consequences of this unprecedented cosmological context for the human experiment indeed for the entire planet it was frederick nietzsche who seems to have recognized most intensely the full implications of the modern development and experienced in his own being the inescapable plight of the modern sensibility, the romantic soul at once liberated, displaced, and entrapped within the vast cosmic void of the scientific universe. Using hyper-Copernican imagery to depict the dizzying annihilation of the metaphysical world and death of God wrought by the modern mind, and reflecting that peculiarly tragic combination of self-determining will and inexorable fate, Nietzsche captured the pathos of the late modern existential and spiritual crisis, colon. What were we doing when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? Backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as though an infinite nothing? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? That is so funny. I can't believe he said that. That's like funny poetry. Okay. I love it. It's great. If um, we again look at the diagram illustrating the difference between the primal and the modern experience of the world, taking into account the full effect of post-Copernican, post-Nietzschean situation, we see the extremity of the late modern human's differentiation and alienation in the cosmos. Okay, so the primal worldview 
has the self within a world with an indistinct boundary between the self and the world so that consciousness and soul are shared between things and yourself in a way that isn't um, bound. And then in the late modern, in the modern worldview, the primal worldview, the entirety of that gets contained inside the self. And then the self is a is self-enclosed, distinct th- um, entity within all other things, where wherein no soul lies. And then in the late modern worldview, um, which is depicted here, that self within the world becomes an even smaller dot, I guess, as the knowledge of um, how many people are here, I guess. I guess. I don't know. You you become even smaller, I guess, in global when through global when globalization happens, in the late modern world. I hope that made sense. So continuing, um, the source of all meaning and purpose in the universe has become at once infinitesimally small and utterly peripheral. The lonely island of human meaning is now so incongruent, so accidental, so ephemeral, so fundamentally estranged from its vast surrounding matrix as to have become in many senses insupportable. Yet it is perhaps the very starkness of self-contradictory absurdity of the situation that suggests the possibility of another perspective. The modern mind has long prided itself on its repeated success in overcoming anthropomorphic distortions in its understanding of reality. It has constantly sought to purify its worldview from any naive anthropocentrism and self-fulfilling projections. Each revolution in modern thought from Copernicus onward, each great insight associated with a canonical name in the grand procession, from Bacon and Descartes, Hume and Kant, to Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, Weber, Weber, <laughs> Weber Freud, Wittgenstein, Heidegger, Kuhn, and the entire postmodern turn, um, has brought forth in its own manner another essential revelation of an unconscious bias that had until then blinded the human mind in its attempts to understand the world. The gist and consequence of this long, incomparably intricate modern and postmodern epistemological development, epistemological development had been to compel us with ever-increasing acuity to recognize how our most fundamental assumptions and principles, so long taken for granted as to fully escape our notice and perceptibly bring into very being the world we consider arguably objective. Mm. how our most fundamental assumptions like the earth being at the center of the world of the universe is so long taken for granted bring into being the very world we consider are unarguably objective Um, as a post kunian philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend recognized, a world of universal principles brings about a change of the entire world. A change of universal principles brings about a change in the entire world. Exactly. Speaking in this manner, we no longer assume an objective world that remains unaffected by our epistemic activities. So that would mean that... Um, we can't assume that the world, the objective world, the physical world outside us remains unaffected by our activity of knowing it, except when moving within the confines of a particular point of view. You can know something from different vantage points. Except... Speaking in this manner, we no longer assume an objective world that remains unaffected by our epistemic activities, except when moving within the confines of a particular point of view. We concede that our epistemic activities may have a decisive influence upon the most solid piece of cosmological furniture. They may make gods disappear and replace them by heaps of atoms in empty space. Oh my god. 
Let us then take our strategy of critical self-reflection one crucial and perhaps inevitable step further. Let us apply it to the fundamental governing assumption and starting point of the modern worldview, a pervasive assumption that subtly continues to influence the postmodern turn as well, that any meaning and purpose the human mind perceives in the universe does not exist intrinsically in the universe, but is constructed and projected onto it by the human mind. Might not this be the final, most global anthropocentric delusion of all? For it is not an extraordinary act of human hubris, literally, literally a hubris of cosmic proportions, to assume that the exclusive source of all meaning and purpose in the universe is ultimately centered in the human mind, which is therefore absolutely unique and special in this sense, superior to the entire cosmos. To presume that the universe utterly lacks what we human beings, the offspring and expression of the universe, conspicuously possess. To assume that the part somehow radically differs from and transcends the whole. To base our entire worldview on the a priori principle that whenever human beings perceive any patterns of psychological or spiritual significance in the non-human world, any signs of interiority in mind, any suggestion of purposefully coherent order and intelligible meaning, these must be understood as no more than human constructions and projections as ultimately rooted in the human mind and never in the world? Interesting question. Perhaps this complete voiding of the cosmos, this absolute privileging of the human is the ultimate act of anthropocentric projection. The most subtle yet prodigious form of human self-aggrandizement. Um, I could see how the reverse could be true. Perhaps the modern mind has been projecting soullessness and mindlessness on a cosmic scale. Systemic systematically filtering and eliciting all data according to its self-elevating assumptions at the very moment we believed we were cleansing our minds of distortions. Mm, I would like to look at that again. Perhaps the modern mind, maybe I should underline this one, has been projecting soullessness and mindlessness on a cosmic scale, systematically filtering and eliciting all data according to its self-elevating assumptions at the very moment we believed we were cleansing our minds of distortions. Have we been living in a self-produced bubble of cosmic isolation? Perhaps the very attempt to de-anthropomorphize reality in such an absolute and simplistic manner is itself a supremely anthropocentric act. I believe that this criticism of the hidden anthropocentrism permeating the modern worldview could not be successfully countered. I believe that this criticism of the hidden anthropo anthropocentrism permeating the modern worldview, they, they don't think anyone can counter this ar argument. Only the blinders of our paradigm, as in this case, have prevented us from recognizing the profound implausibility of its most basic underlying assumption. For as we gaze out now at the immense starry heavens surrounding our perception, precious planet, and as we um, contemplate the long and richly diverse history of human thinking about the world, we must not consider that in our strangely unique modern commitment to restrict all meaning and purpose of intelligence to ourselves and refusing these to the great cosmos within which we have emerged, we might in fact be drastically underestimating and misperceiving that cosmos and thus misperceiving at once overestimating and underestimating ourselves as well. Perhaps the great Copernican revolution is, in a sense, still incomplete, still unfolding. Perhaps a long-hidden form of anthropocentric bias, increasingly destructive in its consequences, can now at last be recognized, thus opening up the possibility of a richer, more complex, more authentic relationships between human being and the cosmos. I don't know, this is getting very, like, this last page is so, um, so just, like, really thesis-y, but this is the last page of the chapter, so, um, so, um, 
Questions and issues like these compel us to direct our attention with new eyes both outward and inward. Not only inward, as we habitually do in our search for meaning, but also outward, as we seldom do because our cosmos has long been regarded as empty of spiritual significance and unable to respond to that search. Yet our gaze outward must be different from before. It must be transformed by a new awareness of the interior. The questions and issues we have confronted here require us to explore yet more deeply the nature of the self that seeks to comprehend the world. They press us to discern yet more clearly how our subjectivity, that tiny peripheral island of meaning in, in the cosmic vastness, subtly participates in configuring and constellating the entire universe we perceive and know. They compel us to examine that mysterious place where subject and object so intricately and consequentially intersect the crucial meaning point of cosmology, epistemology, and psychology. Okay, so that was the end of the chapter one. Um, I was reading about, I think I, this was page 30, 32 to 36 of Cosmos and Psyche, and that's um, our first book club meeting. Um, let me know if you enjoy this kind of video. I thought it would be um, a, a sort of content that would be good to fall asleep to or to listen to while doing a chore or something like that, or just have on in the background, you know, kind of like a podcast style. But um, it was just me live reading a book and kind of reacting in real time. So if you have any comments about that, leave that below. Let me know if you like the style and I'll make more. Make sure to give this a big thumbs up. If you got this far, you have to ring that bell. You got to subscribe. If you made it this far, you got to give it a thumbs up as well. And even comment below. All those things are going to help me reach a larger audience here on YouTube.com where I plan to, you know, produce content for as long as I have an engaged audience like you. So thanks for coming along with me on this journey. And I hope to do more of these readings in the future. Um, I think it's fun, especially when, with an exciting book like this. Good night.